an eight by eight thing that was built in the garage and we're getting more details tonight on what exactly investigators knew and what they were tipped off to. Take a look. This is from the incident report involving a call from a handyman. The complainant on the call, only identified as Jack, advised he was contacted by the owner of blank in the blank to build an office in the garage of the residence. Jack advised he agreed to do the job, but after receiving the instructions for the build, he began thinking it was very strange. Jack advised the room was built as an eight foot by eight foot space in the garage with its own ceiling and own door. Jack further advised the door had a deadbolt lock and the knob only on the outside. No knob inside. So if someone were inside the office, they would not be able to exit unless someone opened the door for them on the outside. Jack stated he was also instructed to build this space with electricity and install a window air conditioning unit as well as a camera in the ceiling and stated the entire project was to be completed within two days. Some bizarre stuff. Some sick, sick stuff. It wasn't an office. It was not an office. There was also a bucket left inside and a mattress. The mattress to sleep on, we know what the bucket was for. Still with us, Professor of Forensics at Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan, private investigator Jason Jensen, and forensic psychiatrist Dr. Carol Lieberman. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, I want to begin with you with this 8x8. Eight eight. This, is, this is some sick stuff. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, by my calculation, I think most prison cells are a wee bit larger than that. Uh, we always hear 9x9. Nine 8x8, nine. Eight eight, this is your child. This is the person you're charged with for their care uh and this goes to the idea of deprivation ben uh where you're depriving this poor child of uh well just the kind of community uh interaction that you have within a familial context uh and it it just absolutely cannot be healthy in this environment uh and being locked you know how, how are his needs being met? And I, I have to, you know, the bigger question for me is what would be the motivation behind this? What would be the trigger to get these individuals to do this to a child and not just for a month? I mean, we're talking, they said, was it 2017, Ben? That's what the original reporting is that uh, it was confined since 2017. The timeline is a little fuzzy when it comes to this actual room built because apparently uh, Jason Jensen, um, this handyman made a call in december of 2021 a couple of interesting right. things there this thing needs to be built in two days it seems like it was an emergency uh kind of situation for this family right right yeah because what happened was this couple just recently moved from arizona so the environment that he was forced to live in was carried over from what, where he was living in Arizona and they needed this quick build so that he could be confined again while they were in their new home in Florida. So this was something that they were not intending to, to quit doing. This is with a lifestyle for this adopted child. And what concerns me is they're saying, oh, making excuses that maybe this child had attachment disorder. Well, well no kidding. You're not having any bond with this kid because you're keeping him in isolation. Dr. Carol Lieberman, I want to read for you um, part of the incident report where this uh, teenager describes, a, a, I guess, a typical day. I asked the teenager to describe a typical day for him, and he stated in the morning he is woken up by Blank because his door is locked. He advised Blank would wake him up in the morning, tell him to go to the bathroom, and then back to his room. Blank stated, uh, or he stated, uh, blank would lock the door and usually turn the lights off. Uh, he also advised he would be in his room until blank would return from dropping blank, another one of the children, off at school. Blank advised once uh, blank was at home, she would feed him breakfast consisting of banana on a piece of bread and peanut butter. He stated once he was finished eating, blank would come back in the room and he would get dressed and go to school. After school, he stated... Blank would pick him up and return home 
and he would go back into his room. We've heard talk about reactive attachment disorder. Um, Dr. Carol Learman, your thoughts about reactive attachment disorder and your thoughts about the life that this hmm. child has been subjected to. Well, reactive attachment disorder is where a child uh, does not have um, loving parents or loving caretakers to attach to in the first place. Now, we know that he was adopted, but we don't know um, at this point or they're not telling, you know, what his life was like from his, with his parents or his mother, um, who he came from originally. I mean, that's really, he was just, he was, um, he had problems before he came to live with this family. And um, that needs to be investigated. But, um, you know, people, kids get re at reactive attachment disorder because when they don't have a stable, loving a set of parents or a parent um, to develop this loving bond with, or if they get changed around from home to home, then they get afraid of loving whatever parents they would like. Let's say this adoptive couple, they're afra he's afraid of forming a loving attachment with them because of what he has had before that. Now, that's not an excuse for the horrendous treatment that they're giving him. Clearly, if they adopted him and they started seeing some of these behaviors and some of the behaviors that reactive um, uh, attachment children have are they're very volatile, they can be violent, um, they're irritable, uh, they're afraid, they're very fearful, they're afraid to be touched, lots of very difficult behaviors. But when they saw that at the beginning, they should have brought him for treatment. Um, you know, at this point, it seems like he should be in a psychiatric hospital for a long period of treatment before he can come out and be with any family where it's safe. Do you think this child can ever get better? I mean, if we're talking about five years of living this way already with potentially a, a pre-existing um, disorder and then going through this for five years with, with this adoptive couple, can he ever get better? It's a lot of damage. You know, as a psychiatrist, though, I like to believe that everybody can get better. It's just that it's going to take, that's why I was saying, you know, an intensive time in a psychiatric hospital. But it is really hard. Um, and when we see this, you know, unfortunately, with with some adoptive children, especially when from a, from a foreign country, like from Russia, children that are adopted from Russia often have this problem. Um, we don't know where he was adopted from, but but yes, this is gonna take a long time because he has to trust. It's all about trust and it's all about letting in nurturance from some couple, some people around him. And that 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 has been destroyed. Of course, you know, it's really interesting because he's been going to school every day. Why didn't he tell anybody in school? Well, the investigation is continuing here. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, uh, great to see you tonight. Thank you so much for helping us out. These are difficult issues and your expertise is appreciated. Joseph Scott Morgan, Jason Jensen, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to open up tonight's Unsolved Case File. Don't go away.